everybody can hear me now. Great. So we are starting this session. Maybe some people are still coming in, but I really would like to welcome you all here in the room and also especially the people joining us online. So this is um, the second session of the session, second day of the shock final conference. And today we are going to focus on the training materials and in particular the verification of training materials. So we have a set of speakers and we also have a panel discussion today where we hope uh, we can get into discussions about how to make our training materials that we've developed in shock and generally in the community more fair. So my name is Ricarda Brauchmann. I work at Dance and I'm your session chair today. I'm really happy to be here and see people live and I hope we have nice discussions. So just to give you a bit an overview of the program, I'm first going to give a bit of an overview of the key results that we have made in the shock training work package. And then we're really going to go into the topic of today, which is the verification of training materials. We have three presentations. Um, two of our speakers will be joining us online. And after the three presentations from Elizabeth Newbold, Ellen Lehnertz and Juliana von der Leck, we will have a panel discussion where we'll also give the opportunity to Venkat and Irina to um, uh, present on their perspectives. And then we're gonna, gonna have a lot of time for discussions. So I encourage everybody to think of questions and also in particular the people online, you can provide questions in the chat. Uh, feel free to do that and then we'll have some time for discussion later on. So, as I mentioned, I want to give you an overview of the results of the SHOCK project and uh, in particular the things we've done in Work Package 6 on fostering communities, empowering users and building expertise. So this was the training work package which had five different tasks. Um, they're listed here, but really what we were doing is actually these three things, namely organizing training events and creating training materials for the SSH, building the SSH training community and developing tools to enhance training in the SSH. So this is what I will go through now so that you have an idea of the work that we've done in the past three years. And some of this will also come back with our speakers later on. So in terms of training events and materials, we have been working uh, very hard this whole time to deliver training events and create materials for others to reuse. And of the uh, hundreds of events that we have done in shock, there were 28 uh, events specifically dedicated to training. So these were longer events where people had um, possibilities to be trained in various topics. All of these training events you can find back on the shock website and the materials are also shared in our Zenodo community. So these slides will be made available afterwards and you can find all the links. You can also have a look at the deliverable where all of this is summarized. But in short, we had 28 different events. Um, most of those were online. Um, luckily, now we can come together again. But of course, due to the pandemic, most of our training events were online. And we also spent quite a lot of time on making the events suitable for an online audience. So we developed, for instance, um, a bootcamp formula where we had um, bootcamps that were tailored to this online environment. We also created an overview of existing training materials and um, also created a lot of new materials. And these materials are also listed in one of the tools that we'll come to back later. The, one of the other tasks of the Work Package 6 was the establishment of the SSH training community. So this was um, our effort to bring people together that are working on training in the SSH in various disciplines. And you can see on the map that most of the trainers that are involved are from the European area, but we also have some trainers in other countries all over the world, which was very nice. Um, I've taken now the number that we mentioned in our deliverable, which was in November, which was uh, 172 members. Now it might even be a bit, bit more, but really a lot of people were interested in this community and joined us in various ways. So the members come from different SSH um, disciplines and they were, um, they were joining us in various ways. So one of the things we did, which included, was included in the training events was uh, train the trainer boot camps that were specifically designed for this training community where we uh, presented uh, ways of reusing training materials, but also um, how to set up your training, didactics, various different things. We also had monthly community calls covering different topics and also inviting speakers from the community to share their knowledge with each other. And we had a community mailing list where people could share events or interesting things. If you're still interested, 
you can, for the last month of shock, still join this community. And also you can read up on all the events we've done in our deliverable. And then the, the last thing I wanted to mention is that we de also developed some tools for training and enhancing training in the uh, SSH community. One of the, I think, key outputs of our work package is the SSH training discovery toolkit on which my colleague Ellen will talk about uh, later on as well. So this is an inventory for trainers to find existing training materials that they can reuse in their training activities. It currently covers a selection of 20, 250 items for uh, almost 100 sources. Uh, we're still curating information and if you have something we could add, let us know. Um, so the nice thing about this is that the information is curated. So uh, we try to uh, find materials, um, highlight materials and describe them very well. It's also um, uh, described with standardized metadata that we also try to link. And Ellen will talk about this in a little, little bit more detail. Um, next to the training discovery toolkit, we also established a trainer's directory. And this is basically a database where trainers and experts um, in the field of SSH are listed and people can contact them if they are interested in a particular training. So I think yesterday there was also a question from the audience and what, can we actually ask shock as experts to, um, to give presentations? So this is one of the ways in which you can find out who is involved in the network and who you could ask for a training. Um, at the moment, we have 17 trainers listed, but we're hoping that more people will sign up uh, still before the, the end of the project. And this will also be fed into um, work EOSC Future is doing in establishing a broader registry of experts. So this is, um, this is very nice. And the trainers directory allows you to filter by target audience, domain, language, and also level of expertise. So it's a nice way of finding experts and also of presenting yourself as an expert if you want to. Um, so both of these you can read more on the shock website, but just to give you a brief overview of what we have been working on. And after this, I would like to go to the, the topic, the main topic of today, which is the verification of training materials. And I'm pretty sure a lot of you know this article that came out in 2020 on 10 simple rules for making training materials fair. And this is just to give you an, an overview of what these rules are. And I think this might come back in the presentations later on as well where we today want to focus on what efforts have we made to make training materials more findable and reusable, what are the challenges we face, and also how can we yeah, maybe solve this in the future and make materials even better reusable and findable for a wider audience. And this is, um, this is my introduction to the topic. So now we have invited three speakers. Two of them will join us online and they will talk about their various um, experiences with developing training materials and the verification of that. And the first speaker that we have invited is Elizabeth Newbold. She is leader of the Open Science Services Group at SCFC. She has been involved in the Fair's Fair project and she's also an active member of the Research Data Alliance Alliance group that works on the minimum metadata requirements for training resources and she is going to talk about developing a community approach for minimum metadata. So I'm very happy that she's with us today online. So I'm hoping we can switch to her now and give her the floor for our first speaker. Thanks Ricarda. Um, hopefully you can see my slides coming up on the screen behind me and I'm just really sorry that I haven't been able to join you in person um, but uh, it's great to be here virtually. So yeah as you just said I'm going to talk about what we've been looking at around um, developing minimal metadata recommendations um, for learning resources. So I'm wearing multiple hats today. I'm representing uh, the work we've done in Fair's Fair but also the RDA group on minimal metadata. And so just briefly, uh, I'll look at what we did in the RDA group and then some of the um, work we looked in Fair's Fair, where we looked at testing what had come out of the RDA group and some challenges that we, we think there still is around verification of training materials and a few final thoughts, which perhaps uh, set the scene for some of the panel questions later. So the RDA uh, focus group was looking at minimal metadata for learning resources and what the challenge wanted to address was how we can improve discovery of learning resources for learners, trainers, anybody who wants to use them really. And um, that was really a concentration on the F in, in FAIR. Um, 
But I suppose also because we were looking at trying to come up with a recommended set of uh, metadata that could be used in training catalogues, it would also improve um, the interoperability aspects of training catalogues in the future if we have some common goals and understanding. So the goal was to identify a minimal set of metadata descriptors that can work for both informal and formal learning resources or training materials. And again, it needs to be domain agnostic. It needs to also work from the different perspectives, so the learner, the trainer and the service providers. So quite a challenge, I think, there, um, given that it, it was quite an abstract concept in some respects, but also wants to be very practical. So the goal um, was to come up with a core set that could be adopted by the learning resource creators and the service providers. And as, as I said on the slides, we want to reduce duplication and identify gaps among existing prospective learning resource providers as well. Um, the group started probably uh, around 2020, so we've been going for a little while, um, but it, it's taken quite a long time to actually get to, to the stage we're at now, as you can imagine with everything else that people were working on. So to develop the minimal set, we had initial mapping across different schemas. Um, we developed user stories as well, taking the perspective of the learners, the trainings, trainers, service providers, developers and funders. And these user, so, so, oh, excuse me, these user stories helped us develop uh, the metadata set to make sure that they were relevant to the different user stories. So they weren't an abstract concept, they actually had practical application and could be used in different audiences. We did a lot of community engagement and had feedback by um, the different RDA plenaries. Um, we came up um, the resulting in a set of 14 elements um, and these are recommendations for a minimal set and there is um, a link to the uh, RDA page about this. So, so there's 14 elements. Um, they kind of broadly fall into three different types. The descriptive aspects such as title, author, language, so those core descriptors that are, are not um, particularly specific to learning resources but could be used for anything. Uh, access information, so how you, how you can access the things. And then the ones particularly about learning resources, which are sort of educational information, which look at expertise level, learning outcomes, the learning resource type and target groups. This slide just actually gives a little bit more information on what the definitions around those 14 uh, elements are in the metadata set. And I don't expect to go through all of these now, but it's just useful to have on, on the screen. So, as I said, working within the RDA interest group, we developed these 14 sets. But I'm moving on now to what we did in the first first um, project. So, these 14 uh, elements were, were developed and we've been engaging with. So we, we decided that it would be quite useful to test the applicability of the RDA minimal metadata recommended set, specifically within the EOS context being a, being a project within that ourselves. And we wanted to identify issues to report on regarding harmonisation, which could inform future work. For example, we, we did some collaboration with the use of future catalogue developments to explore how the minimal metadata set could be used to demonstrate improved discoverability and to make some recommendations and to feedback to the RDA group as well. So this was a theoretical look at it. We weren't um, actually applying this to a catalogue itself. What we did, we took a collaborative approach and we gathered examples of materials from across projects, some of which had training catalogues such as Shock and some which don't already. Um, and we got a good cross section of materials from the projects uh, mentioned. As I said, most of these were within the EOS um, project family. And what we wanted to do was look at how widely the minimal metadata set was already being used, how many of these elements were already established in those that have training catalogues, and how easy it would be to apply the minimal set to materials that weren't already catalogued. So we created a test set, um, theoretically, sort of, I say cataloguing, but we looked at um, establishing. Uh, what the minimal metadata set could be applied to and how it could be applied. So where items are already in catalogue records, seeing how they mapped across and where there wasn't a catalogue record already, attempting to create some metadata from the source material. Um, we then uh, presented these results in a workshop in January and, and there is a report available from that in Zenodo. Um, so do, do have a look at that. 
there were some challenges we found. Um, there, most of the metadata elements are in use to some shape or form within the catalogues already, especially those descriptive elements, but not all are used all the time. And that was especially true for those relating to the educational themes and um, learning outcomes in particular. The recommendations from the RDA minimal set is that we, we, we think all of these should be mandatory. And we think this is especially true that if we're describing learning resources, then actually those ones relating to the educational themes are actually really quite important. But these are actually quite tricky to apply. Um, some of the reasons for this is around uh, what the creators of the materials have actually, um, and the producers of the materials have actually provided in the first instance, and also how accessible the materials are. Um, if there's restrictions on access, it's a bit hard to actually, as a third party, um, really address what perhaps learning outcomes are, because they might not be overly visible. So there are tensions between having a completeness and quality uh, of metadata versus the quality of the metadata and how you can maximise the quantity of records included in a catalogue. So that, that there, there is, do you want to have quantity or, or quality and how do you get that balance right between all of those, especially when you want to have sustainability as well of your training catalogues and the, and the curation effort that you might have available to do this. So there is a tension and a challenge about how to improve the quality of the metadata without setting the bar too high, as we don't want to discourage participation or to create something that is too resource intensive to be sustainable. Um, one of the item, um, aspects that came out in discussion was that you know, maybe putting a null value in if you're not sure, so you can say that the information is not available rather than just leaving something blank. Um, we also had very detailed and long conversations about the use of control vocabularies. Given that the metadata set is not making recommendations and um, control vocabularies because this is a, uh, a domain, not a domain specific um, metadata set, uh, recommendation, um, you know, we need to be able to accommodate control vocabularies from across different domains. But it was felt that actually guidance on control vocabularies would be very useful, especially where there aren't obvious ones to use. And again, that came back to the um, information around the education aspects, such as target audience. Um, and again, what do we do about learning outcomes? So these aren't necessarily resolved, these issues. It's an ongoing piece of work. Um, what we think is the RDA minimal metadata set is a really significant first step towards coming towards a common uh, approach to how, how we do this and for making training materials more fair and discoverable. But it is only the first step. It, is, it isn't a complete piece of work yet. Um, th there's still extra uh, work that needs to be done and it doesn't really need to be adopted in real world situations rather than the theoretical set that we tried out it on. The extended metadata and documentation will be vital in filling in the gaps and any possible limitations of the minimal set. And that is work that is starting in the RDA folk interest group now. Um, it sounds a bit obvious to say, but it is actually a really important point to highlight that community approach brought together different viewpoints, backgrounds and levels of expertise, which was really invaluable in progressing the work. Um, I, I think everybody involved found, found it really useful to, to share our experiences and, and to get to the understanding that we're all at now. And I suppose my final thought is that the verification of training materials needs to be thought about at the beginning of the process with, with, the, with the creation of the materials, not just when we're getting to the end of the process of wanting to disseminate them. So. Thank you for listening. I hope um, it made sense. And I'd also like to thank my first fair work package six project members and the ETH RD interest group minimum much data focus group participants. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth, for giving us this introduction to the RDA minimum metadata set. And now we're going to go to the next presentation, which is actually a bridge also to one of the projects that was um, helping test the minimum metadata set, namely the SHOCK project. And the next presentation is by my colleague from DANCE, Ellen Lenertz. She is the training coordinator at DANCE and also was the task lead for task 6.4 in the SHOCK project. She has been involved in various training activities within the EOSC and beyond, and I'm very happy to have her here. The floor is yours, Ellen.
Thank you. Um, yeah, so I would like to say some words about the journey towards fair training materials within the, um, well, by creating the training discovery toolkit within work package six of the shock project and especially task 6.4. So I'm talking here now, but there was a very active team in 6.4 and um, I'm, I'm, without them, it would not have happened at all. And also the connection with the marketplace and uh, task 6.3, I think it's important to mention here. Now, I don't know which button to push. Ah, that's always good if it works. Um, so, just a few words about the context. So, um, you already heard from Ricarda, we were supposed to build a community uh, of trainers and uh, support them. And uh, we, did, we have done that in several ways that she already talked about. And one of the ways was to create this tool. The concept, context outside shock, we also heard from uh, Elizabeth a few words about uh, the minimal metadata for learning resources that has done work done by the RDA interest group. So it's a very, um, it's larger than SSH. Uh, but also within all kinds of previous projects like EOSC Pilot, EOSC Hub, uh, and uh, Elizabeth mentioned Ferris Fair, now also in EOSC Future, there's uh, a lot going on uh, uh, around learning resources and how to make uh, learning resources available in a fair way. And also, so that means that it also supports the reuse of training materials. One of the, the things that came um, out of the EU DOT project was the community of practice of training coordinators. And I really want to mention that because it, it, uh, it, uh, um, the training coordinators there are from not only from uh, social sciences and humanities and not only from the shock project but from everywhere <laughs> within Europe so uh, this has been a really good platform to discuss for example uh, previous let's say iterations of what kind of metadata do we want what what do teachers need to be able to, for example, reuse materials. There are also a lot of other discussions going on in that community. So if you want to know more, you can use, you can look at the uh, page that is mentioned there. Now the training discovery toolkit, as you uh, now, I think can imagine, it was to improve the discoverability of training resources. So, um, uh, it's a, it is a catalog, so it's not a repository. It's a catalog for trainers that list good quality uh, resources and uh, support the use of training resources, um, specific metadata. So we, we, we explicitly aligned closely with the RDA group around this. Um, I don't know if you have seen the Training Discovery Toolkit, but we started it in uh, April 2020, so it's not that old. Uh, and um, the training resources, at that point, we thought it was most valuable if we would collect materials on research data management and open science and topics that cross domains. So, so that means that there are not only resources in the toolkit that are uh, from, for example, Clarin or Daria, but also uh, um, outside the, uh, uh, let's say, the uh, research infrastructures that are now also in the Memorandum of Understanding. Uh, the first um, um, pilot of the Training Discovery Toolkit when it was launched was in April 2020 and we immediately involved the training community that we also set up in Task 6.4 to provide feedback and also uh, training coordinators that were also within the SHOCK project um, were really willing to provide feedback. And what was uh, really nice is was um, we didn't know at the time, but we were not the only catalog emerging in the, within the EOS project. So, of, within the, so there, for example, there's also a catalog in EOSC pillar, like uh, 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 Elizabeth just mentioned. Um, and we have different, how do you say that, um, different 
perspectives. Um, but I think the feedback that was important that that the the trainers really liked the look and feel of the tool, so it's easy to to filter, and but they lacked also an about page that would explain some of the of, of the fields that were used. And the original result was a catalog containing, which is with a creation team within uh, Task 6.4, uh, 41 sources and 70 training materials. In 2021, um, the main goal was to, let's say, uh, professionalize a bit how it looked. So we did uh, the about page was created that explained the terminology that, that was used, but also set up uh, a more solid creation workflow uh, with guidance materials and a uh, creation team and plan creation sprints. Well, especially Ricardo was very active with that. Um, but we added uh, lots of sources and example items. So this is also something that we, we wanted to keep in mind that we couldn't cover everything, but we wanted to make sure that all the sources where you find good training resources are in the toolkit. So maybe it is not always um, a certain course in the toolkit, but it does mention a couple, maybe a couple of items that would represent what kind of uh, items you can expect in the toolkit. Now this year, which is, well, we are in April, but it uh, doesn't feel yet like April. But we've done a lot this year because, as you already saw, the, there was also um, uh, some outputs from the RDA uh, Minimal Metadata Group. So we wanted to align with that. We wanted to make sure that the, met the recommended metadata from the RDA was also implemented. We had some feedback still, let's say, uh, resting in our cupboard <laughs> that we wanted to implement. So we changed the data model uh, that we originally had and we adapted, uh, added uh, metadata fields, for example, learning outcomes and um, um, implemented and published even certain uh, vocabularies, uh, uh, either recommended by the RDA group or uh, found by us and thinking that would be a good way forward. And then also a lot of these uh, metadata was mapped to, uh, well, all of the metadata was mapped to uh, schema.org and it's also implemented on in the tool and on the website. So now you can harvest the output of the training discovery toolkit and you can also, uh, I mean, uh, we, we did this uh, also to improve the discoverability because the, the metadata uh, uh, mapped to schema.org also uh, used by Google, Google so it uh, should be more visible now. Actually, the curation sprint is still going on. So at this very moment, there are still people curating uh, and adding sources and examples. So now we have, I checked, I think yesterday, <laughs> 99 sources. It's not about the quantity. I have to say that again, <laughs> but we try to also create it in qualitatively, 261 items. Um, a little bit about the challenges and the lessons learned. So we, we now, after two years, um, we have to say that a good quality catalog, as you probably all know, is, very, is hard work and it needs community agreed, um, let's say, um, standards like the one from the RDA, but also it needs uh, effort uh, by the community and when you want to evaluate uh, learning resources that come from, for example, humanities or, or, or a certain field, then uh, I would not be the person that is an expert and I would not know if that's a good quality source so, or resource. So that, that means that the creation cannot be done by anyone. It, it has to be done by a team. Uh, within the training discovery tool, we started out of, of collecting uh, research data management and open science material. That's also because we were more knowledgeable in that field and we're uh, piloting with, with those sources. Um, uh, let's see. Yeah, but it's also, um, I think, but what but, but should be what has come clear to us is improving the metadata and um, 
um, how much metadata you require to put in, either by a creation teams or by the source organization, is a balance because you cannot, you know, people, um, um, for example, if you create a, a MOOC around um, a certain topic, then the metadata that is uh, there for that MOOC might not be the complete metadata that we want in a training discovery toolkit, so that this, the creation team adds the metadata that is missing, but you cannot do that endlessly. But if you have good quality metadata, it surely improves the discoverability of the training materials and also improves the reusability. For example, uh, if you use uh, the access condition, uh, one of the, I don't know if he's here, but uh, one of the participants of the, of the conference is, is doing the challenge around uh, the training discovery toolkit and he already experienced that because we added access conditions in which was a recommendation by the RDA group, um, he, was, he was able to select and deselect a certain resource, like, okay, if it's not accessible uh, uh, at any time, then I cannot reuse it for my own training. So these, these are things that are really saves you time if you are a, t a teacher. Um, yeah, I think this is it also. So, um, the journey, well, that's one word then, <laughs> uh, one sentence. The journey has not yet come to an end, as you uh, realize probably. Um, it is uh, the training discovery toolkit is, is looked at uh, for integration within the uh, SSH marketplace, but also um, um, we are looking at integration or let's say uh, ingest into the EOS Future Knowledge Hub. That's it. Thank you, Ellen, for giving us an introduction or a deep dive into the Shock Training Discovery Toolkit. Our next speaker is Juliana van der Leg, and she should be joining us online. So if we can get her on screen, that would be great. Welcome and thank you for joining us in this um, discussion and in this panel today. So Juliana is the Training and Education Officer at Claren. She is making training materials fair within the Claren infrastructure and also coordinating Claren's activities in um, amongst others, the upskill projects and various other activities. I'm very happy that you are with us today and I hope you can share your slides. We can see at the moment um, the speaker view, I think. So just a second. Yes, we can hear you well, so that is great. Okay, that's good. Just a second, my mouse froze. Trying again. Okay, I think you can see my whole screen. Now. We now Let's see the whole screen, screen, indeed. Yeah, I tried to. And now we can see the slideshow. Okay. So thank you very much. Everything seems to be set up. Um, thank you. And the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. So um, I'm Juliana van der Leck. Thank you for the introduction. And I'm sorry I'm not able to be in Brussels uh, today, but I'm, I'm happy that I can share online. So today I'm going to present, to share a little bit of our experience uh, at Clary. Actually, during my first year at, at Clarin as a training and education officer, I started an analyzing how um, how fair are the training resources, uh, not only training but also knowledge uh, resources that we share through the distributed infrastructure. And I've 
learned that we offer quite a lot of information and expertise that um, uh, would uh, really help universities and teachers in upskilling uh, their, um, their students and future professionals. But they, we need to pay a little bit more attention and also um, invest more effort in, ver in the verification process. So we're starting uh, thinking um, very consciously at uh, this process. And I'm going to show you different discovery means um, and also our practical experience with the, with the training discovery toolkit and a solution that we uh, think uh, that we are trying uh, right now uh, to help teachers improve uh, the discoverability and reusability of their training materials. So if one teacher from the clarin or outside clarin will go to the uh, SSA training discovery toolkit searching for clarin materials, will, uh, the search result will show about 47 results. But we have so much more to offer. The current uh, resources come from these uh, sources. So basically what uh, also Ellen said, uh, from the depositing services, knowledge sharing platform, legal information platform. So basically those uh, platforms at Clarin that offer information about research data management. And uh, we're also closely collaborating with the, short shock, with the shock team to uh, upload also an inventory of training materials relevant for teachers in language and linguistics programs um, that are currently uh, creating new training material in a project called Upskills. So we will share um, this uh, resources will also be discoverable via the toolkit. So we are very happy uh, about this collaboration. OK, when taking a closer look uh, to some of the um, uh, training resources that we have um, piloted last year together with Ellen, uh, for example, we tried to harvest, uh, the team harvested uh, the training materials collected via a teaching with Clarin call that we launched last year in order to find, to collect more resources from the, from the, from the teachers. Um, we understood that there, there is more um, effort needed to curate uh, the resources and uh, improve the, the quality um, and also their, their reusability. And um, I also um, noticed that there are still a lot of resources, important training material that has been produced during the shock, pro shock project, which are currently missing. Um, so then I tried to uh, to search for these materials and also um, to see how they can be findable and identify potential issues. Um, so, for example, this shock webinar hands on tutorial on transcribing interview data, which is a great tutorial is present bo both on the shock and Clarin websites. But uh, was not discoverable via the toolkit. Um, so I looked for it to see where it has, where the training materials have been deposited. Um, so the authors deposited the materials on Zenodo and also chose to create a collection in the Clarin Virtual Collection Registry, which was presented yesterday uh, during another session. Uh, seeing this, uh, then I started investigating uh, the usefulness of using the Virtual Collection Registry uh, for teaching and training. And I realized that especially um, when we organize events at Clarin, for example, Clarin cafes or uh, Clarin conferences, sometimes we, we, have, we organize tutorials or workshops and the resources are scattered uh, on different platforms. For example, somebody is producing something on GitHub, then um, a data set is available in a Clarin repository. And we also have a nice blog post on the Clarin website describing that workshop or event. Then a virtual collection registry uh, would help um, the authors pulling all those resources together in one collection and make it citable. So um, this, this functionality currently is missing from the SSH training discovery toolkit. So then yesterday during a hackathon, talking to some teachers, we realized that maybe there is an opportunity there trying to, uh, to integrate closely the VCR with, with the toolkit in order to uh, help teachers quickly add the resources they found in the toolkit to a collection, for example, or, or 
their own resources that are scattered across different platforms. OK, um, looking at uh, another example that I had in mind, I was trying to find some uh, resources or uh, specific resource on the Latvian copyright and personal data protection that I know we offer um, uh, via Clarin, the Clarin website, to see if it's findable in the toolkit, but it was not. Then I tried to uh, find it myself. Uh, so on the Clarin website, when searching on the Clarin website for this uh, tutorial, um, then you are taken to video lectures which is an archive that Clarin has with, uh, of recorded lectures from uh, with 100, 159 videos from 16 events, uh, which is a very useful archive um, that uh, teachers can use and in integrate in their courses or refer to students to, to if they want to learn about a certain topic. I analyzed the metadata to understand, OK, what is the minimum metadata required to uh, describe these video lectures? Uh, you can see an overview here. Then I also went to YouTube because YouTube is another platform where we store our uh, knowledge sharing, uh, the, the um, uh, let's say uh, in interviews and also workshops and other uh, uh, recordings from, from, from the Clarin events. Training is a very popular topic. We discovered um, the YouTube's, uh, the descriptions um, the metadata is, is, is minimum. Uh, we have a description license and also a link to the um, referring to the specific events. But I realized that uh, we could uh, maybe expand this metadata in order to uh, help the teachers understand what is useful for them. For example, when taking a look at um, YouTube channels um, created by the other uh, uh, nodes in the Clarin infrastructure, I've realized that uh, some guidelines, some fair guidelines might be uh, needed so or they would benefit from more guidelines to increase the consistency in the description. So uh, a basic description of the video uh, of the workshop, for example, distributed uh, from, uh, from a summer school uh, should contain a, a basic description, uh, license information, which is not always mentioned. And um, if the event uh, is in another language, a translation would also be very helpful in order to increase the, the reusability of that material. And um, some, uh, for example, ACDH, which is a Clarin B Center, offered very nice uh, metadata to describe their lectures uh, from a summer school. Date, description, speaker, title, um, but they had no, no license information. Nevertheless, the event were very, very nicely described and, and structured on YouTube. So basically, I don't need to search for more. I can just um, decide to stay there and watch the whole event um, if I need to. So it's very, very important the way we describe uh, the resources we offer. Uh, the Clarin Cafes uh, are a very, um, is a very nice platform that we launched during the COVID time to share uh, expertise on a specific topic. And uh, they are very useful. What, when analyzing these cafes uh, and the slides in, in detail, I realized that they are a useful source, a rich source to extract training content and also identify learning activities. But uh, here we will benefit from some guidelines as well in order to make them all citable. For example, not all uh, the slides are deposited in, in Zenodo. And the main topics are findable via Google. Uh, but not via the Training Discovery Toolkit. Um, and uh, during my searches and my exploration, I also uh, discovered that uh, some uh, teachers also deposit training resources in the Clarin data repositories, which are mainly, um, um, which have been mainly developed for depositing data sets. But some centers accept also depositing of training materials. So I looked at all these materials and analyzed the metadata um, and also tried to understand uh, what the needs are. Uh, here you can see, find some examples and also different parts, how I, how I found them. Uh, so via different infrastructures or via search uh, uh, using certain keywords. And then in the end, um, 
we realized that maybe the way to go in order to help teachers uh, improve the verification of their material is to uh, to help them uh, to encourage them to apply via call to share materials uh, via call um, provide clear guidelines um, where they need to deposit them and how to uh, cite them and then collaborate with the shock team uh, to make sure the metadata is harvested in the toolkit um, so these are the let's say um, we found issues at, at all uh, all the levels just to note that um, you can you, could you round off we have to move on yes. to the next speaker thank you yes okay so um, uh, this is the call um, there we use uh, we have developed a, a form uh, based on the 10 simple rules for making tra training material fairs in order to help the teachers uh, think about fair in a conscious way and we selected the metadata based on the investigations and uh, what we found out that is important uh, for the usability and uh, what i would like to highlight is that um, Basically, the optional metadata is the most important part in uh, uh, for reusability because uh, it's very important not only to share materials, but also describe them um, and also describe the experience of how they use the infrastructure. It includes notes, reusability notes for teachers and trainers, feedback from students and how the materials can be adapted to other disciplines. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Juliana, for highlighting some practical tips already. I think we will come back to that in the panel discussion as well. I've been notified that there was a question online, but we will wait for the questions until the panel discussion, which we will start in about 10 minutes, because for our panel, we do not only wanted to invite these speakers, but we also wanted to give a bit of a broader perspective. So we have invited uh, Venkat and Irina as well for this panel, and we want to give them a, a brief moment to introduce their perspectives. So the next speaker that I would like to invite is Venkat. He is the training officer at Open Air, and he's highly involved in training and skills workers, work package of EOSC Future as well. So he will give a brief um, introduction of his perspective on uh, verification of training materials. Thank you, Venkat. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for the invitation to be here. And uh, I'll just give you a very brief uh, introduction to what I'm involved in. Uh, it's just five minutes. So, green button, is it? Okay. So, EOS Future is uh, primarily what I'm involved in, although Open Air is actually my employer. Um, but I don't want to get into the nitty gritty of what um, EOS Future is all about, but this is three of the core tenets that I've actually just copied and pasted from the grant agreement. But essentially, you're trying to build a system of systems, it's uh, building on a lot of previous EOS work and uh, we're trying to create an EOS platform. But um, this is just a, a summary of what's going on uh, across the project. But I just want to highlight that uh, in the user engagement part, um, there is a specific uh, part on training, and that's what I'm involved in through Work Package 9 there. And um, one of the things that we're trying to do is also build a knowledge hub, which has been mentioned a few times, I think, so far. So, the training and skills, uh, it's providing the training and support across the project and the EOS community. So we're trying to create a training program uh, as well as building this platform to host materials uh, and provide the training capacity there as well. Um, outreach to projects and communities interested in um, engaging with EOSC and uh, other factors as well. So we have these other things like the um, open air uh, community of practice and yeah, other initiatives, other EOS, um, sorry, um, infra EOS projects as well. Uh, we're trying to engage with all of these all together. So this training catalog, indeed, it's been mentioned that we're using the RDA minimal metadata set. Um, so we're in this enviable position that this hard work's already been done and we can actually start from scratch, which is great because we can actually do this by a fair by design sort of uh, perspective. So indeed, we've um, also approached four test pilot cases. Um, these have actually been mentioned already. Indeed, Shock, uh, Daria, uh, Elixir, 
um, and EOS Pillar, uh, we've actually had bilateral uh, chats with all of them just to see what they've been doing with their catalogs and how we can actually build our catalog within um, EOS Future. Um, so adapted for use with criteria, uh, varying for aggregated and pre-existing materials versus new directly added materials. So this RDA minimal metadata set, we've adapted it slightly depending on whether we're doing um, automated aggregation of these um, materials into the platform or whether we're talking about new materials that are actually going to be onboarded. Uh, we, we want to use a slightly different approach to those uh, two scenarios um, in terms of how strict the criteria might be. I could describe that later, maybe. Uh, so it's a pragmatic uh, approach we're trying to um, have here and ju just to try and make sure we are as inclusive as possible. And yes, fair by design. And just briefly, the other thing that I'm also involved with is the Open Air Project. Uh, that is actually my main employer. And I just wanted to describe that something that we're doing in parallel is actually building another learning management system and catalog. Um, and we've uh, named this Open Plato. It's actually coming online very soon. Uh, we've got a sort of beta version uh, at the moment. I pl I'm playing around with it. Hopefully it'll be up and running very, very soon. And indeed, we're adopting the RDA minimal met metadata set there as well. Um, I have a bit more of free reign on exactly how this works in this particular platform, but I want to try and make it as stringent as possible um, as we are for EOS Future. Um, it's going to be free to use for providers um, within the open air community, but uh, beyond the open air community, we're still figuring out exactly how might, that might work. But for end users, it is going to be completely free. And finally, we've already mentioned this a few times, so I don't want to go over it again, uh, but I am involved in this um, paper we're writing about practical use cases of uh, verifying materials. Uh, so we've been collating um, use cases, uh, indeed shock and um, uh, Claren are two examples in there. And we want to use this as a, a way to provide a relatable document uh, for the community in terms of how they might go about um, verifying their training resources as well. I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you. And this will lead us to our last uh, small presentation from Irina Vipachbara. She's the head of the department at the Slovenian Social Science Data Archive, and I think very well known to many of us because of all of her involvements in training activities, including SHOCK, but also the SESTA training working group, which she is leading. So I'm very happy that uh, she will also give us a short pitch, and then we will continue with a panel, and uh, you can all ask your questions. Thank you, Irina. So, um, thank you everyone. We heard uh, quite many good presentations already today, but li I would like to give you some insight of what we were working on uh, with CESDA in the last few months. So, this is the situation that, that was, or it's still on the web page. Uh, what we did is that we put um, um, a presentation of a certain event that we hold in the last year online with a bit of the description, a dates, and the links to other materials. And having so many events online in, in the last past years, this was really not working anymore. You know, the web page was totally full of all this information. There was like no way to find anything. And I was like, we need to do something about it. And um, yeah, we started looking at possible metadata schemas. And one of the, the schemas uh, that we found really interesting was uh, the schema from, from Needy. But it didn't really you know, fill in a sage domain uh, as these. And one of the elements that we also um, mentioned, that was mentioned in previous uh, presentations, but um, the elements in, in vocabulary. So um, it's not only the field itself, it needs to define also the text. So um, at that point, uh, we, through, through the colleagues and community of practice of trainers, find out that RDA is actually working on the minimal metadata for the learning resources. And we said, okay, let's go for that. 
And yeah, um, as you know, we, as usual for the events, we have several different types of resources, as they are for slides and, and presentations and um, other different small documents like information sheets that we would put there. But also we have a uh, train the trainers materials that are in there. So we are trying to put them now on, on a different platform. Um, yeah. And this is the list of the, the 10 simple rules that was mentioned several times. It's not easy, really, because some of the elements are missing. I think, as, as Juliana also pointed out, we are putting some of the materials on the YouTube. YouTube doesn't offer persistent identifiers. So what to do with that, you know? Uh, so we, we, are, we are working on different workflows on how to go about it. But yeah, some things are easy. We are sharing, but you know, is it a unique identifier? Um, what actually means to be reusable? There are many open elements. I think that we can discuss that in, in, in the panel later. But I would like to give you also some screenshots of how this will look like in, in really near future. So this is basically uh, now prepared. We are just uh, waiting for the, for the launch of the full uh, SESDA webpage, which I'm hoping will happen um, soon. Uh, so we are going to list uh, the materials. Uh, they're having uh, special tags uh, that identify whether it's a slide or a video or any other materials. We currently propose two filters, um, but also sorting. Um, we will think about whether we need uh, something else. And this is how it looks like when you click on one of the materials, you have all this uh, metadata information uh, that is needed for uh, proper reading. So they're basically uh, two Are we back? Yeah, thanks. Um, what I wanted to add is that um, one of the problems, as Juliana was also mentioning, we had with, with the collections. So how do we link materials that are linking in, in, certain, in certain events? And we added one of the fields uh, here is accompanying resources. Currently, in this example, it's only one, but if there are more um, materials that are being uh, produced for a certain event, we are going to add it there. And what is also important for us is that it's not only a registry of a training materials, but that we link that training materials that we have in this registry back to the events. Because what is the real situation is that uh, a participant that was at a certain event, they remember the event. Most of them will not go to the catalog. So what is important for us is that we have at the event page that we are now also um, rebuilding, that we have links to the resources that we put them in the catalog. So this is really important, an element that we found out that we need to do on that. And just to mention, um, yeah, um, the platform that we build this on is based on the PIMP Core and Symphony uh, with comple com complementary technologies such as uh, Elasticsearch. And what is also really important that this was also a use case for the for the SSH open marketplace, so the um, API is now established, and it could all of these materials that are now in the catalog could be harvested through the SSH open marketplace. And just to wrap, um, so there's still a lot of things to be done, especially defining all the workflows um, for for organizers, for editors, for publishers. You know what we need to do that because currently we moved what we had in previous resources um, to this catalog, and and it currently hosts a bit more than 100 um, elements in, in it. Um, but yeah, um, we need to link that to the, all the, the events that we held in the past. We also figure out that we need a sprint for updating uh, metadata information because not all minimal metadata that we now proposed were available for all the materials. So we need to update some of that. But the core question is also, what is, you know, about the quality of training materials? Are we putting everything in the catalog? Who's making decisions? What is going to go there? And we need to figure out what to do with the, our the train the trainers materials uh, because there are, there are many in this ex uh, example. So this is kind of a short element that I wanted to just to show up what we are doing in, in SESDA in this field. And, and yeah, I think that's it. Yeah, thank you, Irina. I think this is nice. Um, 
nice bridge to our panel discussion. So I would ask Ellen and Venka to come and come to the front as well and take take a seat. And then I hope we can get our um, online participants, Elizabeth and Juliana on screen as well, so they can join us for the panel discussion. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm very happy with our technical support in the back. So thank you. And welcome back, Elizabeth and Juliana. So we now have time for questions. There is a question uh, online and I would like to give the floor to them. Yes, so the question is, has the question of duration of training resources come up in the development of the minimal metadata set or the training discovery toolkit? I'm asking from the premise of reusability for users. How long will this thing take to read, do or learn is one of my first questions about a training resource. Ellen, do you want to start? Yeah, it certainly came up uh, uh, a couple of times. Actually, one of the first things was that people would say, which is quite some years ago already, why would you like, why, why would you want to have a catalog? Because training resources are generally outdated very fast. Uh, people uh, were thinking about slide sets and then, you know, you, you, you repurpose them, you reuse them, but then they changed and, and so on. So how do you come about that? But uh, eventually the, 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 the community of, of trainers decided that still we do want it, but um, I think the um, extended, let's say, extended metadata that, was, that will focus more on reusability of, of, um, of training resources is, is really important. So I don't know if that answers the question completely. Maybe Elizabeth wants to yeah. contribute? Um, th there isn't probably much more to add that Ellen has said as well, because when we looked at the minimal metadata set, it is trying to put what the minimal is needed, but we also know that people have, um, that's not all that everybody needs. Um, when we looked at uh, the minimal set, the date one is around version date as well, so I've kind of tried to address that, that there's a version. Um, that you need to know that you're looking at, but the work on extended is, is sort of, we, we delayed some of the questions because otherwise we would never have got to a minimal set, I think. But it is something that has come back a lot. And also, that I'm quite sure about but the duration, the duration is about probably the description how we cannot really hear you very well, Elizabeth. I don't know if this is your connection, but sometimes you are a little bit hard to understand. Oh, um, I can try carry on speaking or stop. I think now it's now it's better again. I just thought I'd let you know. I think now it's better. Sorry, um, I was going to say there's also um, in, about whether information about um, if there's a training course catalogue, how long that would take to complete, and that's the sort of information we can look at the extent of metadata work. Thank you. I hope that answers the question from online, and then I'm curious if there are more questions also from the audience here. Matteo. Uh, I would like to understand better or hear more about the the op open air, um, the various open air efforts with respect to, so there is the open air kind of the main catalog, which is for all the research outputs, would you say, and kind of also with the category other. So would you see training materials there or so you said the open plateau, so will there be a separate uh, catalog just for the training materials or? It's separate. Yeah. Sorry? It, it is separate. Separate, okay. Yeah. So just like the other services that OpenAir provides, like Provide Explorer, this is a separate product, if you want to put it like that. And um, there'll be a catalog of training resources, et cetera, in there. The key difference between this and what I described in EOS Future is that EOS Future is specific to EOS, anything relating to EOS, not just EOS Future, but anything relating to EOS. Um, what Open Plato is meant to be about is, is a wider remit. Um, 
it, it's not just EOS, it will have uh, other training resources as well. And it is, and we specifically are positioning it with, without trying to brand it open air in too much of a way because we want to be, make it separate, you know. That's why we've given it a different name um, and it, it's hopefully going to attract a lot more users that way. And you would be, if I may follow up, you would be sourcing from, I mean, there are dozens of uh, platforms which, which already either with, resource, with learning material, training materials or already catalogs. Yeah. So, and what is the scope you would want to well, harvest? This goes back to a discussion about sustainability. Uh, we feel, in, at least through open air, we have the resources to guarantee that. And as an example, there's Research Data Netherlands. Um, we, we've, you know, had a few conversations with various parties in the community. Um, and Research Data Netherlands, they've got their Essentials for Data Support um, course, which is excellent. And it's looking for a home, for example, for in terms of sustainability. So we can guarantee that. I know there's no absolute guarantee of how long that might be, but. It will be for a while. I, I, I know that much. For yeah. example, okay. And, and so, uh, but home for so, uh, would it be the so we will be hosting the training materials too? Yeah, or? yeah, yeah. Um, and, we, and we we have the software as well through licenses for uh, authoring tools as well, so you can create or rebuild existing courses, for example. Um, so that's possible. Uh, uh, sorry, last one, <laughs> then I'll stop. Yeah, because, last one, because yeah. we want to give others uh, yeah. opportunity so the, to ask the, too. The kind of the ty types of training material or the kind of the, the learn LMS, you will be, it will be like Moodle or what kind of Moodle. Moodle, okay, thank you. Any other questions from the audience? Not yet, okay. So we also had some questions prepared and I think it would also be nice because multiple people were talking about the situation now and how there are things that need to be improved. So I would like to ask our panelists, what do you think is the, the, the one thing we should do sort of in the next future? What are things that you see coming up, um, following up on the work that we have already started? Maybe Irina, do you want to start? Uh, thank you. Yeah, I mean, there are many. <laughs> uh, I think uh, what one element, as, uh, as also Juliana was mentioning, is that we really need to give good instructions to whoever is organizing the events so that we can actually put all this information in any catalog that we are building. Uh, but another challenge that I have is, you know, what do we do with kind of... Um, materials that are coming from different events, as also was presented with, uh, from Elizabeth, you know, um, most, of the, most of the projects would put, uh, you know, some information on, on their web pages and they put it there, the link to the materials, and when the project is finished, you know, nobody goes to, the, to that web page, you know, so where are we putting those, you know, we need to find it, I don't know, it's going to go in, in, in the open air now or, or, or not, you know, that, that's kind of, a real problem that I have, I think we as infrastructures, we will cover what we have on our, for our own. But what do we do with other materials that need to be visible and they are not visible outside the projects? Yeah, so I think the question of sustainability has been coming back in this, in this whole conference a couple of times. And I think also one of the nice things is that we have this memorandum of understanding for the shock partners. So maybe there's a way of taking this forward. I would like to ask Juliana to comment on this and how you see this for Claren, which is obviously also one of the big infrastructures. And would there be a role for these uh, bigger infrastructures that are established to actually take on the responsibility of sustaining materials developed in projects? Um, yes. Uh, indeed, um, I think the way forward is to provide clear guidelines to teachers, trainers, event organizers, and try to find a, let's say, a harmonious or a way to go forward in order to um, make our work easier and, of course, increase the reusability and the findability of these training materials. Because there is a lot of work, uh, teachers put a lot of work in developing these materials, especially when you think of, at the language. Um, resources and software uh, that uh, we are specialized uh, in Clarin. Um, and it would be great if, if this um, 
uh, workshops uh, on tutor and tutorials on specific tools and software are developed in such a way that can be reused and easily integrated uh, and adopted in other courses and disciplines. So um, I think most work we'll have to put now next in, 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 this, in uh, coming up with some clear guidelines that of course, and use cases that we are now also working on this paper with uh, with open air and other infrastructures where we we discuss the issues and try to come up with uh, some clear common guidelines at the SSH level. Thank you. Ellen wants to comment, I think. Yeah, I think I think what is what we have lacked within the training discovery toolkit is um, um, making uh, automated ingest possible. So because of the diversity of metadata at the source level, and I think um, if you make the, um, if, if, if the publications of learning materials is fair by design, this will make the automated ingest much easier. So then you can decide if you want to ingest these metadata also, share this metadata also within uh, EOSC future or within a future uh, catalog uh, by, um, um, SSH uh, or anywhere else. I think that's that's, uh, and then it would also reduce the load of creation effort uh, by a, by teams that may not be as knowledgeable as, for example, the Claren team is and knows which, which resources are most valuable, which used resources should be reused, or you know. So I think that we have now, uh, uh, how do you say that? We we got experience from that and I think that you can see it from the SESTA uh, initiative that they are now also creating a catalog with very good metadata that can be ingested quite easily because we have this common metadata. Yes, and so I think what is maybe a good bridge to, to Elizabeth is actually the work of the RDA group, right, on, on creating the sort of standards that we all want to use. So I wonder, Elizabeth, what your perspective is on this in terms of the next steps in the future there to make sure that actually we all and the different pro projects implement this and, and sh ensure that everything actually becomes interoperable. Maybe you want to comment on that? Yes, sorry, the fire alarm was just going in the background. Um, I, I mean, I don't really want to be the voice of the RDA group because I'm just one member of But I think um, there is the recommendations which would be out for consultation of the RDA group. I would like people to, to look at that, obviously, and also uh, consider joining the RDA interest group participating in the future developments. But I think, um, yeah, the extensive metadata work will be really interesting to, to go beyond what is minimal to address some of these issues that have been brought up by Rina and Juliana as well, that that's been a metadata probably doesn't cover everything that people need. Um, I think so on a slightly related note, it's, and I think Irina mentioned this, what do we mean by training materials? Because of in the RDA group, we try to apply the for formal and informal materials. Um, and I think by formal materials, are probably easier to deal with if you have curation done. There's a lot of informal materials being created and I think that's a real challenge that we need to address as well. Thank you. Does anybody want to comment from the panel or otherwise, if there are questions from the audience, please raise your hand. If there are no questions, then I might want to get to back to something that was briefly mentioned by a couple of you as well, namely the use of controlled vocabularies. And yesterday we also had a presentation on the, the shock vocabulary comments, which was an effort of the, the shock project to actually establish a registry of vocabularies. And I was wondering how you see this and whether you think that um, a way of moving forward is also not only aligning on the metadata, but also on the vocabularies. And maybe you can comment on in what way this is implemented in the current systems and also the systems planned by open air in your future and also the SESTA system. Yeah, you can go first. So I can definitely speak from the EOS future perspective that we've identified. Yes, absolutely. We need to use controlled vocabularies for various fields in the catalog. Um, we may still have to make a decision on exactly which controlled vocabularies that they're going to be, but we've had that conversation 
and we need to make a decision. And the more we can use it across the different fields, I know you can't use it for every one of the 14 fields, the better. I mean, this is all about increasing the power of the searchability, and that's what this is all about, discoverability and all that. And the more we can use that, the better. Um, so yes, we will implement that as much as possible, and that goes the same for open air as well. Yeah, from the training discovery toolkit perspective, we have published a couple of vocabularies that we are using and that we created and uh, also align with uh, other groups. For example, uh, within the RDA um, group, there were some recommended um, vocabulary, well, recommendations regarding um, um, using vocabularies and we for example, currently looking at learning resource types. So th these are, you know, it's really <laughs> detailed that you are looking at, are we going to use this or that? But if you want to agree on something, it really comes to, to details also with, even with vocabularies. But maybe you want to. Yeah, I'll, I'll just second what was said, you know. Um, you know, we, we were looking at different possibilities in how to define audience, how to define what are the types, you know, and, and there are many, so we needed to make some decisions. But yeah, I, I would second that there, um, perhaps in the level of RDA or, 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 or above, um, that we can agree on, on how we name certain fields, you know, the, the content of, uh, and the vocabularies. And, we also notice that um, namings might mean different in different disciplines. So that's also a bit of a challenge, you know. So even if we use controlled vocabulary, we need to agree what it actually means um, for some of the elements on that, yeah. I see both of our online panelist members nodding. Juliana, do you want to comment on this? Um, no, uh, I think I agree with what Alan and, and, and Irina said, but uh, it would be indeed very useful if we have, uh, if we all agree, all SSH infrastructures, we can, can come up with some, a unique vocabulary that we can use to describe our training materials. Thank you. Elizabeth, I know that the RDA has also looked at uh, various training materials, but maybe you also want to comment on your experiences also from the other projects. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I commented about from the RDA thing, we've had quite a lot of discussions about this. Um, and I think there's a lot of discussion still to come from everybody. Um, we've provided examples of control vocabularies, but it's it's it, it's taken us sort of 18 months or so to get to a minimal set of recommended metadata. So I suspect getting agreement on control vocabularies is going to take a similar amount of time, probably for people. It's not easy. So I guess this is again also an. an uh advice for everybody to join the discussions if you have opinions on this or want to contribute. Um, I would like to focus for our last question on the reusability of training materials because now we have discussed a lot um, about the catalogs and the, the way we would try to describe the metadata and the information of the training materials. But I would like to ask you to maybe um, consider what are current limitations of reuse, but also what do you recommend? So what is the one thing you can you, you would recommend to enhance the reuse of materials as sort of the final question of this panel before we go into lunch? Um, thanks. Yes different elements to discuss, you know, what, uh, what is the software that you want to use that uh, some of these materials will be visible. Um, I think in these last years when we were really working online, um, recordings have helped this reusability because people really know what's, what's there. Um, what we notice is that, you know, we, we are building on the slides that doesn't have a lot of text so if you're not an expert in the field, it's difficult to understand what actually a person meant there. So for the trained trainers, what we are doing is to put a bit of a script um, actually below the slides so that you know when a new trainer comes, they know what they need to say on these slides. They can or reorganize around, um, but it is a work. And in, in general events uh, that we would help, we would not have this kind of text on and really 
glad that we now have videos so it gets a bit more understanding in the in the back but yeah it's a special work to do and and design uh, train the trainers materials i think it's uh, a bit more yeah and this I don't know where we are with the RDA uh, group now because there originally was a task group also on extended metadata, so documentation especially for reuse to Im improve the reusability. Um, um, but I, I sort of lost track. If uh, Elizabeth, do you know if we, because in that case, if you would like to join that conversation on what would be needed for for re, for proper reuse of materials what sort of metadata you would need in order to decide if you could reuse materials then um, join the group the rda group that is um, on the rda website mentioned by elizabeth Elizabeth, do you want to comment? Also, maybe your perspective on enhancing reusability and what next steps to take? Yeah, um, on the comment about the extended group, I think that work, it's a different interest group and its work is about to start or is just starting. So do just get in contact via the uh, RDA interest group webpage to the, to the interest group leads. Um, reusability, yeah, because in the first fair project, we did train the training materials and uh, we also tried to reuse them ourselves with different speakers. So that was quite an interesting experiment to see how reusable they actually were. So I think we need to understand what we mean by reusability because it can have different meanings and different purposes. But I would say one very simple thing that people should do about reusability is actually state the licensing terms on your materials because it's so basic, but it actually can be a real barrier if you don't know. So that's a very practical, simple thing I think everybody should do. Nice, uh, very nice suggestion. And I know, Juliana, you also mentioned that in your sort of review of the materials, licenses were not always stated. So maybe this is also something you recognize. Are there other tips or things you yes. think we should do? Uh, yes, indeed. And I also sometimes, even uh, when we try to collect materials via this call last year, before the clearing conference, um, when analyzing the, the, the submitted materials, we saw that the teachers were not consistent in the way they described the learning outcomes uh, for really basic things uh, that we realized maybe they need more guidance on that. So learning outcomes, target audience, uh, notes, uh, how can the materials be reused, uh, the level of um, knowledge required to be able to use those materials by the teachers and also by the students. And uh, what uh, helps for the reusability Sorry, I hear my echo. Um, we realized that at Clarin it's important that we have an assessment committee that uh, uh, checks thoroughly the materials that are submitted by the call in terms of accessibility, level of mod modularity, uh, which is very important because I might not be interested in reusing a whole course, but only parts of it. So that has to be very clear. And um, how adaptable it is, of course, we look at the formats and so on, the clarity, comprehensibility, the readability of the course in general, um, and the content and technical accuracy. Of course, we need experts to evaluate the, the, the technical accuracy and, of, of course, the, 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 um, the clarity of the content. And then uh, appropriateness for, for the clarity community itself. So we do have specific uh, community specific metadata that we would like to have. And we offer that optional uh, as optional fields um, uh, in our, uh, let's say, application form. Yeah, but thank you. I think this is really interesting to have this sort of community specific information as well. This is important for your own uh, for, for your own community, but of course we also have the sort of broader projects like Open Air and also EOS Future. So I'm curious to hear what Venkat, what your opinion is on this. Um, I, I, I agree, of course, with everything that's been said already, but just in a more general sense, um, I, I think it just goes back to this question of sustainability as well. And I think when a lot of training materials are created, whatever they may be, um, there's a lot of short-termism, short-sightedness of what they're doing. And if we can think from day one about how 
they may be sustained for the long term and reused, then that will be a big help in itself. And um, I think that's, you know, for, that's a starting point and then using metadata, etc., falls into place after that. But uh, I know I, I was guilty of it as well when I did a lot of trainings that you don't really think enough about how this might actually be useful in the future. Um, we place licenses on it, etc., but I think, you know, you do it just on autopilot. You don't really think enough about um, how this could be reused. And if we can think more carefully about that and catalogue them properly, um, and then ensure their sustainability and their value, then that will be really helpful in their reusability. Thank you. I think this is a very nice note to end the panel and this session and let us all go for lunch. I would like to have a round of applause for our speakers, uh, present and online. And I would also like to thank our technicians in the back who were helping us with all of this. Thank you very much and enjoy your lunch. Thank you. Bye.